Awesome. Excellent. A very quick intro about this meetup. This is the first episode of season three of the UX community. Uh, here's me, Johannes Feneris, and with me are the dynamic duo, Dimitris Niavis and Dimitris Stathis. Uh, for those new to the scene, UX Greece is a, a hub for UX and product professionals deeply rooted in our beloved Greek communities and events. Every few months, every quarter, uh, we invite global voices to discuss uh, specific UX topics. These meetings are uh, all about the conversation. Uh, as always, it's your curious minds that keep things uh, going. So uh, being here means that you're already part of uh, the community or you have found this link somewhere. Make sure you follow our LinkedIn uh, group so that <clears throat> you'll be the first one to know about our upcoming uh, meetups. I'll pop the link into the chat in just uh, a second. Uh, major kudos to our sponsors, Janssen Labs from Scratch Studio and the UX Prodigy for fueling our gatherings, uh, but also providing some very, very cool books as gifts. And here's a drill to grab one. Post a message on LinkedIn. Uh, just say hi, thank our guests, share a moment from today's uh, meetup with your network and use the hashtags UX and UX Greece. You've got uh, until five hours from now to post. We will collect all the posts, pick the winners at random, contact them direct directly on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, just a, a quick uh, nod, so we always like to throw in the beginning. Don't hold your questions. Uh, don't hold back on your questions. Drop them into the chat or wave your hand to speak directly uh, with Joy. Uh, this is the, the heart of our gatherings, the reason we host uh, all those uh, meetups. All right, uh, Dimitris, uh, could you make a proper introduction for Joy? With Joy, I have to say that this is the most appropriate uh, avatar for UX Greece meetups, the sea behind its summer. Uh, it's That's where that picture was taken. <laughs> That's great. So the was taken in uh, Greece. How about the introduction? And then Joy, the stage is yours. Yeah, uh, I believe, guys, hello from me. Uh, nice to see you all here again. Uh, and uh, a big thank you, you know, in advance to Joe for uh, for uh, taking the chance to talk with us. Uh, so I believe that everyone knows him. You know, he's been at the forefront of UX for the last give or take 30 years, as he's been saying. Uh, he's a UX pioneer, a speaker, a tutor, or I would prefer the word teacher, uh, and a true champion of all UX. And we have the honor of having him with us today. Uh, Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction and uh, I appreciate it deeply. Like I said, anytime I am asked, uh, I'm honored. Okay. Because hopefully what that means is that what you're offering, what you're putting out into the world um, is useful to people. It's valuable to people. All right. So it, it does mean the world to me and thank you all uh, for having me and thank everybody who's here. Okay. All the 70 plus folks so far. I think that's awesome. So what we're going to talk about today is the idea of, and I'm gonna share my screen in a minute, but we're talking about protecting, quote unquote, your US career. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people, when they talk about this topic, they use the term future-proofing, okay? As if there's a way to, to permanently insulate yourself from never being laid off again. <laughs> the place I wanna start is that is not possible, okay? It isn't. Anything you do in your life, there's risk involved. <laughs> A career in this profession or any profession is no different. But what I can tell you is that all the things you're going to hear from me today are ways in which you can absolutely strengthen your position wherever you work, right? And even if you're a freelancer or whatever, um, you know, hoping to not have your client pool dry out. It's the same game, all right? There are ways that you can make yourself valuable to people, to departments, to businesses that nobody talks about for reasons I don't really understand, but I'm doing my best to put an end to that. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go through a presentation. I'm going to, there's a, a lot I'm going to give you. Okay. This is going to be like a drinking from the fire hose experience. I apologize. I'm trying to jam a lot into a very short period of time. Uh, and then I will answer all of your questions afterwards. Okay. Whatever they are, whatever they have, I will absolutely hang out as long as I can to talk. Okay. So don't worry. Um, that, you know, if you don't ask now, it'll never be answered. All right, I will, I'll do my best to get to everybody. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and we are gonna talk about this. All right, so you should be looking at a big picture of me and I have to hide all Zoom's 
accoutrements. Okay, so you should be looking at a big picture of my face. Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Good to go. Okay, cool. So the very first thing I want to do is tell you about a little something called the UX365 Academy, which is uh, something I founded. All right, it's at learn.givegoodux.com. And the kind of thing that you're going to hear from me today is the kind of thing that I do. I believe that there are a whole lot of things that are never touched in UX education and boot camps. Um, and they're largely day-to-day -day reality, how to do the work, how to deal with politics, how to deal with difficult people, how to deal with stakeholders, <laughs> how to have productive conversations, okay? How to protect your career, how to ditch the nine to five and, and start working for yourself, okay? Whatever it is, I think there's, there's a whole lot of things outside process and tactics that never get talked about, all right? So this is self-serving, but I would really love it if you would check it out. And at the very least, let me know what you think. Let me know if there's anything missing. Okay, let me know if there are things that you would like to learn more about that I'm not touching. All right, it's only as valuable as people make it. So give that a look. And my controls are not working. There we go. First things first, folks. I'm a realist. Okay, I'm not a pessimist. I'm an optimist. I firmly believe in people. I have great hope for, for human beings, for this profession. Um, but I am a realist. All right, so some of what you hear today, you may not like. I'm going to tell you that right now, but it'll still be the truth. All right. So I ask that you keep an open mind. You think about it. You consider it. And anything that maybe makes you a little uncomfortable is probably an area that you should probably give some more thought to. Okay. Here's what I hear all the time from people about their, their business counterparts, essentially. They don't get it. They don't get UX. They don't get design. Or, you know, they're barbarians. They only care about the bottom line. Or I hear, you know, these they just want to launch MVPs and they don't care whether it's, it's good or bad or garbage or whatever. And they don't respect us and they don't appreciate us. Here's the thing. All that's true. All right. It really is. But part of the reason that this happens has a lot to do with us. And as we go through this, I think you're going to see why. My essential premise to you up front is this. You can spend a lot of time wishing for what should be, all right? Complaining um, is easy. I do it. Everybody does it. It's human nature, right? <laughs> when something's not going right, the first thing you want to do is like tell the world about it. Like, this is bullshit, all right? But you can waste a lot of time wishing that things were different or you can deal with what is. And I will promise you that in every aspect of your career, dealing with what is, instead of wasting time wishing it was some other way, will serve you well. Next, I want to give you an overriding principle that you're going to hear more about, okay, as we go through this. And the principle is this. In a corporate setting, your behavior reinforces their belief. All those people that you work with outside of product outside of UX and design. That means developers. It means product managers. It means uh, their bosses. It means departmental heads. It means marketing people, salespeople. It means executives, VPs, whoever. This is a really important premise. Your behavior reinforces their belief. We're going to talk more about that. But essentially what it means is this. There's a whole lot about what you do every day and how you do it that reinforces what they believe that you do and are capable of, okay? Here's what we know at this point. Everybody knows that since November, there have been a lot of layoffs, okay? Especially across UX, especially across UX research um, and designers as well. And, and that's been true all throughout history, okay? Any, anytime there are layoffs, UXers and designers are at the forefront. We're the first on the chopping block. That's a fact. That's largely because people don't understand the true value of what we do. All right, so it kind of looks like this. All right, by and large, the UX percentage of, of roles that have been laid off, and this is a study done by UX Collective, it's like 8.7%. And you look at it and you go, okay, well, that's not as bad as I thought it was, right? Not too horrible. Here's the thing. The typical ratio of engineers to designers is 10 to 1. Right? For every 10 engineers, there's one designer. 
the ratio of designers laid off to engineers is one to six. The typical ratio of designers to researchers is five to one. The ratio of researchers laid off to designers is three to one. Okay, so actually, <laughs> by and large, when you look at it this way, when you, look about, when you look at the fact that we're vastly outnumbered by engineering, for example, um, it's pretty significant. All right, so the question everybody asks me is, well, why is it us? Well, it's us because there's no building, there's no compelling business case to retain all UX professionals, all right? It's the belief that smaller teams can have a similar impact. And it's also organizational immaturity, okay? People still believe in this day and age <clears throat> that UX is a nice to have. It's not seen as a critical part of business. And we're going to dig into why that is. Okay. And, and people have asked me, well, why not tech roles? All right. Why isn't it developers? Why isn't it IT? Why isn't it? Well, they were here first, quite frankly. <laughs> when, when product development transitioned to digital, especially in the age of the internet, back when the internet became a thing, because that's how old I am, the tech side was here first. Okay. The developers and programmers are the critical inch because if things don't work, if things don't function, you know, you know, we're all in trouble. So companies naturally gravitated towards, towards those roles first. How the hell do we find someone who can make this work? So they're ingrained in there, they're entrenched, and they are still seen to this day as the critical inch, right? They're the first hires in startups on day one, and the UX roles are later, right? They're often contractors. And when a company has to choose between great UX and critical uptime or functionality, that's an easy choice for them to make. Okay, it's a no brainer. If they're forced to make a decision, they're always gonna go for it, make sure that it works, <laughs> okay? The bottom line is this, as a profession, I believe we have not properly shown our value. I think that we're seen as optional when times are tight. And I think that companies think to themselves, look, we could lay these people off now and we'll outsource. If we really need it again, if we really need UX help again, We'll outsource, no problem. All right, all three of those things suck to read. I mean, it's pretty terrible, but it's also true. The good news is these two things are things that we can actually do something about. And that's going to be the bulk of this conversation today. So number one, how do you show your value to other people outside your role? How do you get them to see that what you do is valuable, not just to the organization in some nebulous way, but to them personally. How can you help them get them what they want while still doing very good things for users, for customers? You start by accepting a very simple premise that is critical to your career trajectory and longevity. Users did not decide to hire you. A business did. Users do not pay your salary. A business does. Users have no say in whether you get laid off. A business does. Are you, are, are you with me? Okay. You feeling where this is going? <laughs> That's an inconvenient truth. But a truth it is. If you work for a business, all right, the primary objective of most businesses is to make money, period. It's their reason for existing. It's the reason they exist. It's the reason anybody goes into business in the first place. Why? To make money. And here's the deal. Even if you go into business um, where the goal of the business is to help human beings, which a lot of them are, you still have to make money in order to survive long enough to help people. <laughs> you still have to make money to pay your lease and your employees and your insurance and everything else, okay? These two words, there is no departing from these two words. And I think folks on our side of the fence quite often overlook this fact. All right, if you're gonna do work that a business deems valuable, you need to know where its money comes from and how it gets spent. And nobody's explicitly taught this in university programs or boot camps 
um, or online courses or anything. And again, I'm making it my mission to change that. So I want you all to understand as we go through this, I'm not blaming anybody. I think that you were all shortchanged in terms of the way you were trained to do this work. All right. But you also need to expand your focus to the parts of the business that you are likely unfamiliar with. There are opposing forces at play in every single business. Okay. The one thing that nobody talks about in companies is that they have all these departments, right? Companies by design have built in opposition because you have all these different departments responsible for very different things. They all get rewarded in different ways for achieving different things. So by design, what you want and what they want are two different things. Okay. By design. So to experience opposition, you know, to have people argue with you about what the right thing to do is, isn't necessarily some strange, annoying thing. It's, it's the direct result of how companies are built and organized. It's their organizational nature. Okay. UX design, we're over here. Business and management is over here. You know, what are we focused on? We're thinking about launching new products, improving existing products. We're thinking about new features and functionality. They're thinking about cutting costs to make our numbers <laughs> and make our investors happy. They're focused on increasing revenue. They're focused on doing more with less. Okay, their goals are not yours. When we talk about what we do, all right, we spend an inordinate amount of time on social media and everywhere else talking about users and research and UX and UI and, you know, code to some degree. This is all the other stuff that a business entity and all the people within it who don't have UX or design roles are concerned about. Are you starting to see the issue here? <laughs> it's a little lopsided, right? We're a small piece of a, of a very larger pie, larger area of concern. I want to show you something called the business campus. This is what business people, folks who take MBAs, all right, in, in universities, this is what they learn. This is the essential structure of any business, all right? You have, you have key parts that they have to deal with. The first is infrastructure, which is your partnerships with other organizations, other providers, the resources you have available to you in terms of time, materials, people, right? The key activities, the things that you do every day that uh, make the business run. There's the product or service itself, which you sell. And there's a value proposition attached to that, which says, hey, this is valuable and here's why it's valuable. Then you have customers, of course, different channels. You have different types of customer relationships. You have different customer segments. Depending on the size of the organization, that could be massive, right? I deal with a lot of financial services and healthcare organizations. Although there are end users, right? There are members um, who have health insurance, for example, or there are patients, um, or there are people who invest their money or people who bank. There are any number of partners and customers, technically, in between the company and those end users. And all those customer segments and all those customer relationships have to be managed and met uh, and addressed. It's a tall order. And then finally, you have finance, which is essentially cost structure, which supports your infrastructure and your product or service. And then you have revenue streams, obviously, which comes from your customers. My question is this. And it would be great if somebody just sort of shouted it out. Which areas here are we typically focused on? Us, UX design. What do we care about? Customers. Customers. Anything else? Products. Okay, okay. customers, products. Customers, products, technology, and uh, money. Right. Business. Right, so on this canvas, Here's where our, where our focus typically is, yes? Which areas really drive business decisions? Remember, you're outnumbered. In a company, you are outnumbered. You're in the minority. What really drives business decisions are these two things. Cost structure and revenue streams. Everything, every single decision made by people outside our profession starts and ends with these two boxes. So a lot of times 
Okay, when a, when a, a manager or somebody shoots down a proposal you have for improving UX, the immediate conclusion you will jump to is, well, you know, they don't get it or they don't understand the power of UX or, or, or and sometimes I've met a lot of people who take that personally. They're like, well, it must be me. I'm not very good at this job, you know, or, or something like that. Or you take it personally, right? You take it as a failing. And the truth is that most of those rejections have nothing to do with you. Nothing. They come from places higher up in the organization that you have no exposure to. Myself as a consultant, okay, I've been working with businesses for three decades. People have asked me all the time, you know, how often do clients not do what you advise them to do? Quite a lot, <laughs> quite a bit. That happens quite a bit. I don't care, all right? Because I don't, I can only change what I can change, right? I only have the, the amount of influence to say, look, here's what I think is happening here. Here's what I see. Here's what I think you should do about it. Here's how I think it's going to hurt you if you go down this path that you're talking about going down. Or if you don't do these things, here's how it's going to hurt you. That is the limit of my ability. If a VP that I've never met decides that they are not going to spend this money, no matter how valuable everyone thinks it is, I have no control over that. And what I'm trying to tell you is that a lot of times the decisions that get made that put UX work off, okay, or minimize it or reduce it, you know, a lot of times have nothing to do with you. Absolutely nothing. All right. So in any company, just give this some thought. I'm going to walk through it okay? So we don't really have time to do group exercises, but I'm going to walk you through this. But I want you to think in your head right now as you look at this. And your company, what does each side want? Okay, what's the business's focus? What's their goal? What are they planning for? What do they care about? What are they researching? And what are they measuring compared to what you are? Okay, let's walk through this. There are opposing forces at play here. The business is focusing on their business model as a whole. They're focused on revenue and cost. We're focused on the product, on research, on design. Their goal is stability and profit. Our goal is great UX and UI design by and large. Okay. They're planning for profit strategies. We typically are focusing on some sort of improvement roadmap that may be attached to business goals. Okay. But it is not purely motivated on balance sheets right? You don't sit in front of a balance sheet every day and try to manage those numbers. They care about sales and prospects. We care about users and customers. They're researching market performance. We are researching users and customers. They're measuring KPIs, revenue, profit, and loss. We're measuring engagement and usability, loosely connected to those things. Okay. Do you see the differences? Again, that's by design. Let me give you an example. And this comes from reality. Let's say you, you work for a streaming video company. Customers deliver 4 million in revenue every month to that company. Seems like a pretty decent number, right? 4 million a month, not bad. Until you look at all the things that they have to spend money on. Okay, like licensing, like production, like marketing, like R&D, like tech design development, like overhead. Let's say that those costs look like this. 5 million in license, licensing, 350 million in production, 70 million in marketing, 12 million in R&D, 30 million in tech design and development, 35 million in overhead, which means your total cost as a company every month is $492 million. Now you're capitalized, you've borrowed money, you have investors, there's an elaborate game being played that allows you to operate on the loss like this every month. But you can see the problem regardless, okay? You got one source of income and six sources of expense. So what's the mandate in this situation? If you are in operating in any aspect of operations, okay, or management, your mandates are to grow this and cut this, right? Here's why that's important. If the UX or design work that you're proposing doesn't serve one of these two masters directly, and if other people can't see the relationship between what you're proposing 
and these two aspects, your job is always going to be at significant risk. Okay. They're always going to be looking at you like, ah, oh, UX is a nice, it's a nice to have, right? It's optional. It's an, it's an expense as opposed to an investment. You can't ignore this. I've had folks who work for startups come to me and, and say, well, you know, we're, I'm proposing all these things to make the product better. And, and they just don't care. They just want to do all this, this pretty work to put in front of investors in PowerPoint presentations. And they're, and they're frustrated because like, well, no one cares about this. And I say to them, yeah, nobody cares about it because the only thing that matters to them right now is finding market fit before they run out of money. <laughs> okay. Because if they don't survive, they're not going to be around long enough to have a product. The only thing that matters for startups, for example, is securing more seed money because they have not found a perfect match between an audience that wants what they have and a product that serves that audience. Right? That's the first order of business. Survive the long enough to make that happen. Businesses that are large are no different. They are always focused on these two things. Public companies answer to shareholders, and that's by law, right? At least in the US, I mean, that's considered fiduciary duty, okay? Startups answer to investors, again, by law. So nobody gives a fuck how delighted users are when a company is staring down missed projections or massive revenue losses. It ceases to matter. So again, we go, well, they don't care about UX. At this particular moment, no, they do not. They absolutely do not because they're taking a beating <laughs> and your direct product owners and managers are taking a beating further on down the line, okay? To improve things, to change this situation. We projected this much profit and we didn't make those numbers. Oh shit, what are we gonna do? Okay, that's the thing that's on everybody's mind. On a related note, nobody gives a fuck about long-term revenue growth from UX improvement either, keyword being long-term, when they can inflate their numbers right now by laying off a bunch of people. Here's the other truth about all these layoffs. In most of those cases, if you do the research, you'll find that, that the companies weren't necessarily hurting, <laughs> okay, for money. None of those people had performance issues. What happened was, the economy was kind of going sideways a little bit and companies saw a really easy way to make their numbers look better. So that's what they did, all right? It's the simplest way to make your numbers look better on a spreadsheet, that's it. It's a business decision. So your work has to be aligned with the greater agenda of the business side of the house. It has to be. This is a personal thing. Okay. When we talk about business goals and business needs and uncovering stakeholder needs and things like that, what I need you to understand is that this is not about addressing the business as some nebulous entity. It's about it's addressing that particular human being, that stakeholder, that manager, that whoever. It's about what they want. And more importantly, it's about what they're afraid of. Okay. It's about what they're going to, what they're afraid is going to happen if we don't make this date what they're afraid is going to happen if we don't fix this problem, what they're afraid is going to happen if we don't get all this done in two weeks, whatever the case may be, there is almost always fear operating behind ridiculous demands or opposition. When someone is arguing with you about what work should be done and how soon it should be done and how it should be done in some cases, that largely comes from fear. They're trying to control the situation because they're afraid it's not going to work. And they're afraid that this thing that they want, which they haven't shared with you, isn't going to happen. I think I said this earlier when we were talking before we started. Um, I routinely ask stakeholders, what do you want? And they'll give me some nebulous answer about, well, our business goal for this quarter is, and I'll say, that's not what I asked you. <laughs> what do you want personally? What do you need to happen at the end of this engagement so that you feel good about what we did here? So that you feel like the time was worth it, the money was worth it, the effort was worth it. What outcome do you need to get so that you can relax your grip 
and feel more comfortable with what's happening here. That's a very personal conversation. And we are not trained to ask it, but I am telling you that you have to get in the habit of asking it. It's not about what the business wants, it's about what that person wants and needs to happen. You got to start asking it that way. All right, so here's some questions based on what we've talked about so far that you should ask yourself. Get in the habit of asking yourself. Have you seen your company's quarterly financials? Do you know what they are? Have you seen the profit and loss projections for the quarter, the year? And if you work for a public company, this stuff is all made public, okay? Common knowledge. Are you aware of customers doing less business this year than last year with your company? Do you know how stock is trending or performing? Do you know the current and potential areas of business your company's going after? Do you know the company's cost structure? Do you understand where its profit margin comes from? Where it makes the most money, All right? And where that margin is lean? What products and services essentially return next to nothing? Do you know what that profit margin is? Do you know how it's maintained? Are you aware of any legal or policy constraints your company is facing right now? If not, you have no clue what opposition is already in place to thwart your job security, okay? Because all those things I just mentioned on that list are things that drive layoff decisions. You're at risk, okay? And by not digging into that stuff and not learning about all that stuff that I just mentioned, you're at risk, okay? You're ignoring reality. And again, it's not your fault. No one ever said this shit out loud. I don't know why. Again, I'm trying to change that. All right, everything I'm giving you today, you can use to your advantage. It's going to strengthen your position. It's going to strengthen your ability. It's going to change the conversations that you have with people outside your profession. And hopefully, it's going to get them to understand that, hey, you're more than just someone who like makes things look better. <laughs> All right, if you're not aware of those things, you can align your suggested improvements with what that business wants, what that person wants, their goals, their assets, their market position, constraints. You're also not going to get cross-functional support or inclusion in your ideas from other departments because they feel like you don't understand their priorities. Okay, for as, as, long, as much time as I spend talking to UXers and designers, I spend an equal amount of time talking to business people in other roles and other positions. And what they tell me by and large is that I feel like, you know, the, the UX folks, they just, they don't get it. They don't understand what we're dealing with. They don't understand why we have to make these decisions. And I blame them as well, by the way, because they're not sharing it. Every manager I've ever talked to who said that to me, I've said to them in, in response, well, okay, have you told them <laughs> what it is that you're after? And then I get this sort of sheepish face, like, well, um, it's like talking to a three-year-old, you know, when they've done something wrong. It's like, well, I, I don't know. I guess. All right. So yeah, it's their responsibility to tell you, but if they're not sharing, you got to go get it for your own sake. Okay. You're never going to be able to convince a manager or a product owner or executive to invest in a feature or research or any other kind of design UX proposals if it doesn't address some of the things that we talked about. All right. You're going to find it tough to choose metrics that really demonstrate design value and true ROI. That term gets thrown around all the time. And I'm going to tell you all something right now that I want you to take to heart. That same bullshit example that goes around the internet about $1 invested in UX yields $100. I want you to abandon that right now. I want you to never say it again out loud to anybody. UXers and designers love to keep pushing that meme and that example. It's bullshit, okay? It's bullshit. It has no basis in reality. No executive can relate to that. It's not concrete at all. And the math itself involved in that study is fuzzy, okay? So forget that. The bottom line here is that if the metrics that you're championing, if the things that you are suggesting they go after are out of step with what those people want, what the company wants, you're the only person that cares about. All right. If you can't demonstrate a solid understanding of the business, you're not ever going to be seen as someone who solves business problems. You're not going to be seen as someone who increases business value through design. And that is what you are there to do. It's why they hired you. 
You're going to be seen as someone whose job it is to make pixels look pretty. I've had researchers tell me that people in other parts of the business think that they're responsible for UI design. Okay? That sounds ridiculous to say it out loud. As ridiculous as it is, it's still true. If they think you're a pretty pixel pusher, guess what? That's who you are. It doesn't matter what you really are. If that's what they think, that's who you are. Perception is reality, all right? And if that's who you are, you're going to be first to go when layoffs come around. Now, what are you supposed to do with all that? Holy shit, Joe, that's a lot of doom and gloom. That's a lot of stuff that I never really even thought about. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. Because I, like I said at the beginning, there is an answer for all that. Okay? There really is. The first thing you do is you act instead of react. Okay? It's like the, the Cobra Kai thing. Strike first, strike hard, no mercy. Where do you need to be to know what they know when they know it? Okay? What meetings are you not a part of right now that you need to be, that you need to invite yourself to if no one else is going to give you an invitation? Okay. This is my thing. It always has been my thing. Never wait to be invited. When I worked for other companies before I struck out on my own in the late nineties, I just, I was nosy. All right. For lack of a better word, I was just listening all the time to people's conversations. Or if we were in a company wide meeting, you know, or a departmental meeting and someone was talking about something, I would just open my mouth and say, can I sit in on that? You know, I know it's not directly related, but I feel like some of the things we're doing probably needs to serve those goals. So it would help me do a, a better, more informed job if I learn more about what's going on. Okay, and that's what you do. You're, you're asking for a seat at the table under the guise of just learning. Hey, can I learn? The real reason you're doing it is so that you can get some intelligence on what the hell is going on around here. So that the next time you have an opportunity to speak up or solve a problem or suggest something, you're in the room when it happens, right? Someone says something and you can pipe up and say, well, you know what? We were talking about something a day ago that might help that and here's what it is. It's uncomfortable at first, okay? But you gotta be in the room. To have any influence, you gotta be in the room in the first place. And by the, the types of questions you ask, especially if they're more uh, departmental outcome focused, business outcome focused, like the stuff we just talked about, you're going to get a very different reaction. First, people will be surprised that you're speaking to that at all. You know, well, you're the first UX person I ever met that ever asked me that question. The next thing that'll happen over time is that they'll see that you get it. And then pretty soon, over time, after you've done some things that have gotten some results, they'll start coming to you first instead of you going to them. All right, but the key to that, the key to making that happen is this very first step, which is you cannot wait to be invited into those conversations. Most internal UX teams <clears throat> operate at what I'd call operational maturity. Okay, there are lots of UX maturity models. This is a simplified version of all of them. Companies that run at operational level, it means the majority of their time is spent putting out fires. Okay, these are functional problems or development problems. We're just, we're trying to keep our heads above water, right? Check the boxes, done. Most places operate at this level, even the ones who say they don't, I promise you. The next level up is tactical, which means the majority of our time is spent solving user or business problems, okay? The holy grail is to be purely strategic, which means the majority of time is spent determining what the right problems are to solve in the first place. The majority of time is spent saying, okay, is this worth doing? What's it gonna get us? Should we spend time and money and effort on this? But that's rare. The longer you're stuck at this level, okay, the more strongly all the incorrect assumptions and beliefs about what you do are reinforced across the organization. All right, if you're, if you're stuck in a tactical role, then your work will be seen as tactical. Your behavior reinforces their beliefs. Remember that? Whatever you spend the majority of your time doing is what you are. And sometimes it is hard and it takes work to transcend this, right? I said this already. If you're the person who puts the icing on the cake, you're the person who puts the icing on the cake. Even if you know, and everyone that works with you knows that's not true. It doesn't matter. 
So you got to act instead of react. You got to research proactively, not just when there's a project, okay? Not just when there's a sprint, not just when you've got a project plan, all right? You got to focus on humans, not the organization, like I said before. What are they struggling with? Are those issues persistent? And how would solving them make them and you look like heroes? I've often said that make my boss look like a hero never winds up on a requirements list, but it should. It should, because it's one of the sh most surefire ways to involve yourself at a deeper level in the organizational decision. Okay, this is the operative word, heroes. Research the product or the service. Keep your eyes open for recurring, unsolved issues, underdeveloped features, things that could be critical to department, product, organizational success. Meaning money. <laughs> if, there is, if there's somewhere where the company is bleeding money and it's something that you know could be solved, right? Self-service instead of call center, for example. I don't know. But if there are opportunities that you see that means you can go talk to somebody about them. And you don't go talk to them and say, I think it would be much better user experience if we did this. You go to that person and you say, look, from what I can see, we're, we're spending this much every single month, which feels like an astronomical amount to me in support. And I feel like if we did a better job of surfacing some of the, the answers to common support questions here, we could probably save at least a quarter of that. Right? That's, an, that's a conversation that, that you want to have. That's how you talk to somebody when you want them to listen to you. You get a very different reaction. You're researching to even or better the odds. Okay, what do you know that can help bosses and higher-ups place significantly safer bets? Find that and share it continuously, even if nobody listens, even if nobody takes you up on those offers. It doesn't matter. You got to get in the habit of constantly floating ideas. I think we're taking a risk here. And I think we could mitigate that risk if we did A, B, and C. Let's do this little piece and test it for a week and see what happens. Okay. Don't wait to be asked for this. May, may I add something here? Yes. Sorry. Do this in writing. Have paper trail for this. It will help you down Always. the road. Sorry, sorry about that. No, 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 don't be sorry. I couldn't agree more, okay? Always do it with a trail. Always, always, always. Okay, but the key is you can't wait to be asked. And you also can't say to yourself, oh, well, you know, I'm new or I'm junior or I'm whatever. Bullshit, okay? You were hired in this role partly because you have a skill and you look at things in a way that other people do not. Your opinion, okay, and your belief, as long as you have evidence, is every bit as valid as everybody else's. People are often afraid to speak up because they're afraid of not being right. We started this conversation today <laughs> saying the job isn't about knowing, it's about finding out. Your job is not to be right. Your job is to ask the right questions. Your job is to interrogate things. Your job is to say, how can we be doing this better? So you can and should volunteer those things. Number two, show your work. And here's what I mean by that. Get it in front of the right people at the right time. You can set up sessions for your team to share its findings and recommendations. You know, invite people who have influence. Invite decision makers, people outside UX and design. I have one team that I worked with, I had them set up what they called a lunch and learn, all right? So twice a month, they ran out, they, they, they grab one of the conference rooms and the, to their credit, the company's willing to cater lunch um, for it. And they invite people all over the company just to come hang out. Here's the stuff we're working on. Here's what we're achieving. Here's some of the outcomes or here's what we're learning. And they're just sharing it. And what inevitably has happened over time is that a lot of the people in that room who have kind of stopped in on these sessions are like, I had no idea you guys were doing that. <laughs> and in a big company, it's even more true because people are really spread out, you know, and everybody's focused on their own corner of the world. Nobody knows how awesome you are unless you make a point to tell them. Okay. Nobody knows what outcomes 
you're achieving or what great things you're, you're doing for customers and for business, unless you tell them, create a regular stage for your work, share discoveries, share insights, share solutions, share outcomes across disciplines and departments, all right? And solicit ideas and feedback, invite people in, all right? Build a sense of, of purpose, of collaboration. And you have, when you do this, you have to speak their language, not yours. That means you lead with outcomes, results, impact, not UX jargon, not UX best practices or principles. I don't know if I have this in this deck, to be honest with you, but I'm going to say it out loud anyway. One of the things I hear often from people is they're like, well, we have to educate them. Again, I want you to strike that word from your vocabulary. It is not your job to educate anybody. Nobody is asking to be educated. <laughs> No matter how you present that, no matter how diplomatic it is, no matter how kind it is, it's going to be insulting. That's how it's going to land. Okay. You don't know anything. I have to teach you. There is nothing to be gained from that approach. You're not educating anybody about anything. What you're doing is you're inviting them into your world and you're saying, here's what we've been doing. And here's how I think it could help you. You know, in case you don't know, that's it. There's no education taking place. Nobody wants to learn UX best principles. They don't care. All right. So even right down to the language we use, the phrases that we use to describe our work, you got to put everything you talk about in terms of language and labels and phrases that all those other people outside what you do will understand. Again, no one cares about this. You got to focus on your message, all right? If you're talking to VPs or department heads or product owners, your essential premise is this. Look, I know you, you folks are placing any number of bets on this company or this product or this service on any given day. This work that I've done or this work that I'm capable of doing can help you place safer, less risky bets with more predictable outcomes. That is something that they care about. Not improving UI, not improving UX, not giving people you delight or a better experience. Okay, this is what they care about. This is what you have to speak to. All right, or you say, I think we can save this amount or make this amount or increase market share or decrease customer churn by doing this thing that I've been thinking about. That's how you present yourself. That's how you pitch work that you want to do. Okay, you get a very different response to this. So next, how do you change the way they see? You? Here's my question. How do you present yourself online? If you, for those of you that do post, you know, if, you're, if you post regularly on social media and you post related to the, this, this discipline to UX or design, how do you do that? Here's a lot of what I see. All right, and I'm particularly picking on the which UX is better thing. Which design is better? <laughs> I see a lot of this. And I see it from experienced designers, actually, as well, who know better. Or people post their work with no rationale attached to it. Okay, this is telling a story. And it's an unintentional story. It's glossing over the value of what you really do. Or this. If I see another Steve Jobs quote, I'm going to throw myself out a window. Yes, yeah, Steve Jobs was the guru of design. We get it. This is not telling anybody outside your profession anything of value. It just sets you up to be a person who's repeating these same mantras over and over again, and they're going, oh, another one. All right. I love Jobs. I think the guy, from a design perspective, I think he was kind of a lousy human being, but from a design perspective, from a product perspective, he understood it. He got it. There's no doubt about that. But this is not helping you in any way. All right, those are just two quick examples. But what you share is who you are. It's how people see you. So if what you share is I make things pretty, that's who you are. Context matters. How do you talk about UX when you talk about it? I'll give you an example with researchers in particular. This is a, a good example of what I see often as a research report. When, I, when, when anyone outside our discipline sees this table of contents, this is what they say to themselves. 
Oh shit. Are you telling me I have to read all this? Are you serious? <laughs> that's what that's what that product manager or or VP of, of whatever says. They go, oh come on. I'm not doing this. 29 pages. I don't have time for that. Which is the truth. They don't. All right. The only thing anyone aside from you cares about are your conclusions. It's the only thing they're interested in. So here's what happens. The report goes into a summary. And the problem is there's nothing in this summary that's of value to a decision maker. Like here's all the discovery work we've done in the last 30 days. I don't fucking care. What does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean? How does it help me make a decision? How does it help us place a better bet? How does it help us minimize risk? All right, there's all this stuff in here in this summary. Nobody has any interest in impressions or philosophical musings. Again, what does this mean? What should we do? What should we change? What should we fix? That's the question they're asking. That's the question they are expecting you to speak to. So it's what you have to say first before everything. Lead with the end of the story. Here's what we learned. Here's what we think we should do as a result of the research. If you're interested in all the details, I'm happy to dig into it with you, but that's the net net of this situation. This is how business people operate, okay? They're largely not interested in the details. They want to know what it means. And they want to know what it means now. Even when I got in this particular report, when I got to the conclusions, there's nothing here. There's nothing, literally. Okay, there's all this reading and there's paragraphs. All right, you should have bullets, to, bullets or, or simple statements, not paragraphs. No one's reading this. Again, tell me, what should we do or change or fix? Period. Cut to the chase. What you say is who you are. All right, if, if what you say paints you as a research nerd in love with researching, instead of what that research can do to help managers, you know, do or achieve. It's who you are. Okay. What do you spend most of your time doing at work? Right. Lots of folks are spending a lot of time in the Figma. That's kind of the gig, <laughs> which I get, right. That's the tool that happens to be the, the tool of a lot of folks. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you gotta be careful. All right, you got to be careful that the majority of the conversations you have and the interactions you have with people is not simply sharing Figma files. Because if it is, the underlying message that is getting sent is that you use software. All right, people who work on design systems, kind of the same problem. Are these necessary? Are they valuable? Yes and yes, absolutely. No question about that. But if the majority of your time is spent literally working on the design system instead of putting it into action in ways that get measurable results, you're going to have a problem, all right? What you do is who you are. If you're a person that uses software that the company thinks they could probably train anyone to use, you got a problem. You know, if you're the person whose use ends once that design system is created, because let's face it, a lot of companies managers in particular get the wrong headed idea that once we have a design system in place, well, guess what? We don't have to design anything anymore. You and I know that's not true, but they don't. Perception is the reality. Okay. You got to extend your influence beyond what you do. The next thing you have to ask yourself, and I know this is long folks. So it's, thanks for hanging in there with me. Is what you do important to anybody else? And here's how you figure that out. It's with a statement. I help who by doing what, how, so that they can achieve what, what business goals are attached to this. This serves their need to be or do or have what. And again, this is personal. I'm going to pause here for a second because I want you to take a screenshot of this. I know the video will be available later, but I want you to take a screenshot of it. And I want you to take some time to answer it for yourself. What do you want to be known for? This is your brand. Everybody has a brand. I've had people tell me, well, you know, I, I don't, I don't, this is this ego stuff about having a brand. Like I don't have anything to do with that. Well, you're misunderstanding what a brand really is. All a brand is, is, is a sort of, projection of the reality of who you are. That's all. Branding is not what you say you are. 
It's about the walk, not the talk. It's a, not what you say to your bosses about who you are as a UX or designer. It's the experience that you leave them with, right? It's the stuff that you do that has them advocating for just how awesome you are. They're going to go tell other people. I have not advertised my services or chased clients for 10 years. Hasn't happened. You know why? It's because of my brand. It's because what I'm known for speaks for itself. I get results. And the only thing I ever talk about with clients is getting results. I don't do presentations. I don't do pitches. I don't do dog and pony shows. What I do is I present a lot of evidence of things that are work that have worked for other companies. And those things, those outcomes are things that those companies care about. All right. That's how I've gotten to this place. It wasn't always like that. Okay. But as we're going to get to in a minute, I became ruthless about not doing anything that didn't get an outcome that people weren't going to jump up and down about. You know, I felt like I either wanted people to clear their schedules for me or kick me out of the room because anything in between is unmemorable. I mean, it's not worth my while. The impact that you have through your work is what builds advocacy. It's what gets other people to sing your praises. It's what gets other people to see you as valuable. So that when that layoff list comes around, they say, you know what? That's cool, but not this person, <laughs> right? Because they're like my right hand. They've helped me achieve all sorts of things and, and I'm not doing that. So you got to start adjusting or deleting or changing the items on your to-do list to reflect who you are, to make it a reality that's expressed in the day-to-day -day way you work. Your projects, okay, have to be value-added, measurable, braggable. That creates champions. That creates people who are becoming your allies in other departments, right? They're co-conspirators. They're raving fans. They're cheerleaders. These are people who are going to make sure that you're involved in things because they've seen firsthand what you can do. And nine times out of 10, it's because you've made them look like heroes in one way or another. Okay. A reputable brand comes from braggable work, period which means you got to start qualifying the work you decide to do or ask to do. Will this make a difference? Will anyone remember this a year from now? Can I measure the impact of this? Can I brag about this? And in situations where the task is menial, right? And it's really not that exciting and none of these things are true. Your only mandate is to get it done. Okay, I learned this from a friend of mine said this years ago and it really resonated with me. He said, look, sometimes the most perfect anything has to be is done. <laughs> These are situations where that's true, okay? If it's not going to help you, if it's not going to be something that everybody's going to be proud of a year from now, it's not going to be something that most of the people outside your department are going to be going, wow, that was really something. It's really not worth every shred of your emotional energy. Okay. It isn't, you got to get on to things that are. You change perception by leading with value. You cannot ever stop trumpeting outcomes. Again, the talk is irrelevant. Your walk is what tells people who and what you are. So you have to make sure that they see and hear and remember your successes at every conceivable opportunity. And you have to make askers. Anyone's asking you for something, qualify their requests politely. Okay. You don't say, well, I'm not sure that's really worth doing. <laughs> what you do is you ask them, okay, sounds good. Tell me what outcome you expect from that work. Tell me what has to change or improve um, when we're done with this, right? What do you want to see happen? Because that's what dictates the work I'm going to do. I want to make sure that I get you what you want here. If they can't answer that question, then you need to do everything in your power to make it wait until they can because that means they don't know why they're asking for it in the first place. You want to try to, to deliver braggable value or die trying, okay? That value is your brand. It's currency. It really is. It's like money, okay? It increases trust. It decreases second guessing. It decreases micromanaging. Once you show people that you can get something they care about, that you have power to help them get something they care about, which you do, the nature of the relationship changes, okay? Now, you're not going to get those all the time. If friend, those of you who follow baseball, I mean, most batters strike out more than they hit, okay? 
But when they do hit, you know, those folks who can, who can hit a home run when it counts most, that matters. So it's not about your average, okay? It's about making sure that you can get those wins whenever possible so that you start to build credibility. You build trust, you build an arsenal, you build a, build a reputation as someone who can make things happen. And you got to be seen and heard. You got to get comfortable, essentially, wearing sales and marketing ads. Not in the traditional sense, right? But you got to see everything you do, everything you produce, everything you deliver. It's a pitch for your work. It's a pitch for what you're capable of. It is a demonstration of the potential of what you have to offer for change, for impact. All right? Create public post-mortem content. Share outcomes. Okay, and, and not just the projects where you won, show the ones where you learned, right? Which means I don't like to say losing, okay? My thing is I think you either win or you lose or you win or you learn rather, <laughs> okay? Share that for the entire organization. Let them see what you're doing. If you don't sing your praises, no one will. It is entirely up to you to step up and wield that influence on the rest of your organization, whether anyone asked you to or not. Again, not in an arrogant way, not in, I need to teach you all something. In, look, we just did this. My team just did this thing. And we really think this is worth sharing because we learned something valuable. And here's what it is. And you got to be understood. Use their words, not yours. Jargon builds walls. Acronyms build barriers to understanding. Both serve to obscure meaning, okay? You need to call things what they call things. I literally when I'm with clients, I, I don't even use the word UX if I can help it, okay? I, I just don't. I don't use any official terms for anything. I just talk about what we're trying to accomplish here, what we want for customers, what we want them to do, perceive, experience, what action they, we want them to take and how that benefits us, right? You gotta, you gotta sort of bring it down to everybody's level. And with deliverables, less is more. All these massive detailed proposals, diagrams, customer journey maps, I'm telling you, they only guarantee that business folks are going to ignore them. When they see all that complexity and all that detail, they're going to go, oh God. Because they think that in order to understand any of it, they're going to have to read all of it. They're going to have to absorb all of it. And that feels like an impossible task. And quite frankly, it is an impossible task. Most people don't understand this the way that you do. It's not second nature to them the way it is to you. You feel like it's obvious right? We feel like it's collectively feel like it's obvious. It's not. I promise you. People sit and nod their heads and agree to all sorts of things they don't understand. You got to keep it simple. The more detailed, the more complex, the more wordy that your prescription gets, the less likely the people who really need to read and understand it are going to do so. You got to stop following orders and you got to start making meaning. Any task can be turned into gold. I really believe this. All right. It's a question of whether you choose to stay inside the parameters of the request. Take it, redefine it, expand it, give it meaning. You don't have to accept mundane as a given. All right. Simple tasks a lot of times will hide big possibilities. So instead of focusing on what someone wants from you, figure out why they want it and redefine and redirect that work to address what it is that they want. All right. Again, this is personal. Don't ask to be told no. When a stakeholder is insistent that something be done their way, don't argue, okay? Don't waste your breath insisting that it has to be a different way. You, you, you create an additional approach, which means you do it their way and you do it your way and you show both. You present both, you test both. Now, people go, well, that's more work. Hell yes, it's more work. It's also necessary. They can't visualize what you're describing. But a lot of times when they see it, they will recognize that it's better. And you got to reclaim your time wherever possible. Start with things that are within your control. Okay. The amount of time and energy that you spend on things that have no impact <laughs> are a great example. Like I said a minute ago, with menial tasks that you have no hope of really changing, just check it off, okay? Check the box, get it done, move on. Get real, think small, ask for and work on less, 
Okay. Instead of insisting you need two weeks for research, for example, redefine the scope. Say, look, I need a day. I need a half day to talk to users. Reclaim all that time that you spend arguing with people. Reclaim all that time you spend trying to get them to see your point of view. Screw that. Spend it somewhere else. If it's not braggable, you either improve it, you postpone it, or you finish it. What you do right now either enhances or detracts from your track record and the perception of your value. And you have to embrace discomfort. Change is not about the issues, okay? It's about moving people out of their comfort zones. It's about forcibly breaking things that are a matter of habit and reflex. Behavior form and belief, remember? Politics is a fact. I had someone say to me literally an hour and a half ago, I really want to work somewhere where there isn't all this conflict, you know, where there, there, there aren't all these politics. I got news for you. That place doesn't exist. Even in the best companies, cooperation and compromise are a requirement if you want to do anything that matters. Okay. We collectively have got to come down off this UX pedestal, stop educating people and start working to find valuable middle ground. Okay. Start having conversations instead of lecturing. You got to pick your battles. There will be times the odds are stacked against you. Fine. Accept it. Move on. Get on to something else. Like I said, clients don't always listen. All right. When I propose things, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I've done the absolute best I can. And that's how I judge the work. Not whether or not they implement it. I don't care whether they implement it. That's up to them. It's not my call. And you got to tell the truth, especially when you think no one wants to hear it. A lot of the folks that you're talking to are surrounded by yes, what I call yes men, because it's usually men who do this. Um, who are just giving people the answers they want to hear. Your truth builds trust. It does, especially when it's inconvenient. And you don't need more budget. If it's going to deliver impact or wow, you got to find the time and do it anyway. People say to me, well, they won't let us do any user research. And I say, can you do desk research? And they say, yeah. I said, well, why are you doing it? Well, because there's no time in the schedule. I don't give a shit. You got eight hours in a day. I guarantee you, you can take an hour somewhere and do a little bit of research on your own. You can do that. No one is preventing you from doing that. All right. There's always something that can be done. Always. And you can and should say no. Okay. Especially if no one knows or can explain what measurable value the work will deliver. When you're working on something that you know is critical, Okay. And someone shows up at your cube and says, Hey, could you just do this thing real quick? You say, well, I got this thing going on right now and it's critical and we have to get it done. So I can, I can talk to you about this, but I can't do it until, you know, three days from now or whatever it is. And if they insist, you say, I understand, but you're going to have to go to my boss or whoever and, and have a conversation with them about that. Because if they agree that this work can wait for this, for that work, Hey, fine. No problem. All right, so the party line is, I'm always happy to, to do whatever, but that's a very polite way of saying no. All right, that's just a quick example. How do you answer these questions? What do you do here? What have you been working on? What's the most significant thing you accomplished this quarter? Again, this is a moment where I want you to screenshot this. And I want you to answer these questions for yourself later. Here's the thing. Your answers should be couched in things like this. I made things better, made things faster, more accurate, more productive, more efficient, more effective, more profitable, more cost effective. Okay. Those are the metrics that matter to people outside your discipline. Those are the ways you answer that question. That's what you're leading with. Outcomes first, tasks and activities second, always. I'm going to say it one more time. Your behavior reinforces their belief. This is your job. This is your career. This is your life. Okay. The only person who stands to benefit most from everything I just gave you is you. 
You can waste it wishing for what should be, or you can live it dealing with what is. And like I said, of the two, the second delivers incredible results. Okay. And, it, and quite frankly, it delivers a lot less stress and a lot less heartache. Stop dreaming, start driving. That's a line from a David Lee Roth song from a million years ago, but I love it. I love it because it's the truth. Okay. You have more power than you think. All the stuff I've just talked to you about is tangible. It's real. It's possible. It's information you can get. That's all I got for you today. And uh, this little book is kind of in line with everything we talked about. And it's, it's 10 of the things that I learned along the way in doing this that have been really, really helpful along similar lines. So if you want a copy of it, it's free. Shoot me a DM. Um, LinkedIn or X is usually where I hang out. I hate to say X out loud. I really want it to be Twitter. Um, send me a direct message and just say book. And if you want to say, hey, and ask me a question, that's cool too. But all you have to say, if you're feeling shy, is book. I'll hook you up with a copy. All right. Thank you all so much for your time, for bearing with me. I know this was long. No one wants to hear me talk for that long, I'm sure. Um, but I hope it was useful to you. And with that, I'm going to stop the share. I'm sure that everyone wants to, you know, just continue talking for hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> Forever and ever. I think that this recording uh, is going to be something to start your day with and end your day with. Uh, start, you know, start from this recording and, you know, select what we are going to deal with today. And then at the end of the day, uh, you know, um, re recall what you did and be prepared for, for the next day. Stop dreaming, start driving. It's a great, great quote. Uh, it's just you're... a different way of looking at what you do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, huge appreciation for sharing with us such valuable insights today. Uh, do we have some time to discuss to okay okay yes. great absolutely we have a lot of questions uh, in the chat but first of all um do we have any volunteer that want to uh, wants to just uh raise his hand open the camera open the microphone and uh, throw a question directly any yeah, volunteer? That'd, be, that'd be easier yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is a discussion so let's start the discussion the last yeah. question i see here on the chat is sotiris if no one else wants to <laughs> let's start take charge <laughs> I, I have a question forward. sorry oh, okay sorry perfect thanks uh first of all thanks a lot i could hear you all day long <laughs> <laughs> thank you if i have no numbers if i have no data to like ensure what i can improve with this hard data how can i because i'm an external or a consultant something away from the the company how can i prove some of these things or there isn't always hard data attached okay but you have to say if you're a consultant especially you have to set yourself up in a way where you know what happens after the fact okay what i do by way of example is i give people i do one of two things okay it's up to them which one they choose i either do a regular check-in X amount of time after the engagement. Okay. And usually that's a couple months. You know, I'll let maybe three months go by and I say, we'll have a check in and you'll tell me what changed, what worked, what didn't. And we'll talk about it. Or I say, especially because a lot of times these companies are spending very good money with me. Right. So it's no skin off my nose to say, look, I'll give you an hour follow up session, follow up consultation at some point in the future. And they will almost always take me up on that. What I am really after there, okay, I want to help them, don't get me wrong. But what I'm really after there is I want to know <laughs> what the outcome was. I want to know what they put into place. and I want to know what happened as a result for two reasons. Number one, so that I can give them good advice from that point forward. And number two, so that I have something to talk about, right? So that I have an understanding of what, I, what the things that I, I suggested to them, what outcomes they produced. Right? It's the only way I know. So I'm not even looking for numbers. I just want to know what happened. If the goal was to reduce sales support, or, uh, support center calls, did that happen or didn't it? I don't care about the number. I just want to know if it happened. Right? Um, whatever pain points they were having, did that happen or didn't it happen? So my first point is you got to set yourself up for some follow-on conversation to learn what actually took place. Right? 
Um, for people who are working in-house who have the same question, they're like, well, I don't have any access to metrics or figures and, and these people aren't even going to share it with me. <laughs> That's fine. But, but in general, you will be able to find out, look, did things get better or not? Did things improve or not? Did more people sign up or not? Whatever, whatever it is, whatever the case may be. So it doesn't always have to be hard metrics, but you got to have something and, and you got to set up a way to make sure you get that information. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Sure. Somebody else. Mm -hmm. Come on. So, so there is. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Joe. Nice to see you again. Uh, thank you very much for the lovely talk. Uh, really sure. inspiring, I think, for, for everyone. Um, so taking into consideration a more mature team in terms of UX and business connection, um, if you think like the bridge between the business decisions and the UX ROI, it's kind of more connected and more close by. Um, you mentioned at some point there are other things that play there, like politics. Yeah. Um, when it comes to product work, have you observed any particular difference between impact, defined as impact to customers or impact to business, and recognition from stakeholders? Oh, yeah. Yes. Because sometimes there, you'll get a positive outcome, but nobody realizes that was you. I mean, that's, that's happened lots of times, right, where things improve. And the UX folks in a product team are like, okay, that's a win for us because we changed all this shit. And a lot of times the stakeholders who need to see where that came from are usually people who are divorced or separated from the project, right? They're not your immediate project product managers. They're people a little further removed from the situation. Um, and in some cases, the product managers want to communicate the fact that this was them. This was their win. <laughs> All the more reason why you have to get in the habit of doing what I suggested here. I say to, to teams all the time, okay, UX teams, product teams, I understand that you're not an independent entity within this organization, but you are a group of four people or eight people or 12 people. There is nothing stopping you from broadcasting what you just achieved to the rest of the organization. Nothing. Could that possibly ruffle some feathers? Sure. Is it still the truth? Yes. <laughs> Do you think anyone's ever going to come after you for saying, here's what we accomplished, here's what we made better? If you do it in a way that also makes your direct product manager look like a hero, never. That's never going to blow back on you if you include those people and make it feel like they're win too. All right, but you have to do that. The only way people are going to know about it is if you do that. And it's uncomfortable for a lot of people. They're not used to doing that, right? Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, do you have another question? We, we do have questions. Do we have another uh, question to be asked? I, I have a, a small follow-up question for, yeah. for Joe. Hi. Thank you, Joe. Uh, uh, thank you, Joe, for 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 the for the for everything. Uh, like always, uh, the problem that uh, that uh, I see in here, for example, in Germany, that that um, uh, I think we you uh, I must invest more time in 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 this uh, uh, politics and uh, than in UX. Um, is it always like that? Or, yes. Um, okay. Yes, but, it is. Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying. That is always part of the equation. Why? Because human beings are involved. The minute you involve more than two people, there are politics <laughs> by nature. And that's because human nature is, okay, well, I need this thing. And what I need is not necessarily what these other two people need. So sooner or later, intentionally or otherwise, people start angling towards kind of trying to get their peace fulfilled, right? It's natural. It's normal. The more people that you have involved in product, the more of that there is. 
the larger the company, the more of that there is. We've been taught that this is a bad thing, okay, that we have to avoid it. If you avoid it, you don't have a hope in hell of transcending it. Yeah. So yeah, you have to be involved, but the key is not fighting, all right? The key is finding out where all that shit is coming from. When there's opposition, when there's argument, when there's people jockeying for position and trying to make sure that their important thing gets addressed, you got to find out what's driving this. I have said to people verbatim, all right, especially people who are sort of loud and brash and insisting that it has to be their way, right? And sometimes these are product managers, sometimes they're team members, sometimes they're executives. What I say, and I keep my voice even, just like I'm talking to you right now, I don't ever raise my voice, I don't ever get excited. I, I, my thing is calm in the face of all storms, right? No matter what is happening around me, no matter what crazy shit people are doing or raising their voices or whatever, I say, look, just tell me honestly, what are you afraid of here? What are you afraid is going to happen? If this doesn't happen, if this doesn't take place the way you want it to, what are you afraid the outcome's going to be? Just tell me. All right, I can't help you if you don't tell me. There's no reason that you or anybody else can't say the same thing. All right, we're in the habit and, we, and we've been taught that like you should be like this so that we have to defend it. We have to fight for it. It's bullshit. You have to have a conversation with somebody and say, look, what do you, just tell me honestly what you're after here. I want to help you get it, right? But I can't do that unless you talk to me about well, what's happening. Opposition comes from fear. People getting mad and, and playing, you know, games and power plays and politics in general. It all comes from fear. You got to find out what's driving that. And then you got to speak to it. They tell you what they're afraid the outcome is going to be. You say, okay, here's the thing. I think that this approach that, you're, that you want to take right now isn't going to get you that. In fact, it's going to get you the opposite of what you want. All right? So if this is the outcome you want, let's work together. And I think here's how we get it. But until you get to that point of the conversation, nothing you say is going to move that needle. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. It's, a, it's allowed to be uncomfortable, folks. Okay. Those conversations are allowed to be uncomfortable. It's okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have... Uh... I have two hands. Okay, uh, Abanov, uh, am I telling this correctly? <laughs> That's perfectly correctly. Thank oh, you so much. Great. Thank you, Joe, for this amazing and helpful talk. Uh, yeah, if it goes five hours, I'm willing to stay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll talk all day. So I, yeah, <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Yeah, that's that's totally okay. So I have a question. It might be a little bit um, out of um, you know context, but. I am a person who does UX research, UX design, UI design, design system, everything. And I have been working with startups and it's mm -hmm. quite a journey, you know, to, to be with startups. But I have been with the company for three years and in the latest year, I have I have that feeling of being pushed outside of the table. I, I used to have like a pretty good seat at the table. I had, I had a pretty good opportunity to say what I want and I did, it's everything. But at some mm -hmm. point, I don't know what happened maybe changing of, you know, managers and people in the company. And then I got a little bit pushed or outside. And I have been trying so hard to get a seat back at the table, doing research and finding, analysis, like, you know, uh, findings, uh, learnings, everything. Yeah. And it just yeah. doesn't happen. I don't know why. I don't know what to do. Did that, did yeah. that start with a change in management? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this new person doesn't understand what you do, doesn't agree with it, doesn't like it. I don't know what it is, okay? And it doesn't matter, quite frankly. Yeah. The question is this. Who was it that invited you into those discussions in the first place? And is that person still there? That's the first question. No, they're, they're not still there, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. And that dictates how you, how you proceed. Here's, here's the... The delicate balancing act, okay? You have to find a way to have a conversation with those people. Again, you're not begging, you're not pleading, you're not convincing. You're having a conversation with those people and say, look, 
here's how this used to work. And what's happened since then, since I'm not a part of any of these meetings anymore, to be honest with you, my work is not as effective as it could be. My work is not directly addressing all the goals that I'm sure you all have that I don't know anything about. Okay. It's not happening. If I don't know, I can't work to it. You know, if I don't know what you're after, I can't help you get it. It's as simple as that. So I really need to be sitting in these conversations. Otherwise, I'm going to be guessing. And guessing is not going to serve any of you well, right? You're going to be disappointed with the results. And that's really how you put it. And you see where the conversation goes. Now, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to be willing to hear that and they're going to say, well, okay, yeah, we absolutely want your work to feed our efforts <laughs> and help us get what we want. So, yeah. Or they're going to dig in their heels because maybe that person feels threatened by you. I don't know. Okay. I have no way of knowing that does happen. But until you at least have that conversation, you have no way of knowing whether this is a possibility or not. I think that as long as you keep it even keeled, as long as you say, as long as you are, are, are really, really emphasizing the fact that look, the job of UX, the job of design, the job of all these things that I'm doing is to help you folk get what you already want. All right, that's what you lead with. I can't do that if I'm in the dark about everything that you're doing. It's that simple. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I, I mean, I try <laughs> and see how it goes. Okay, thank that's, you. That's all you can do, okay? And if the answer is no, the answer is no. Fine, you got to start looking for another job, maybe. Who knows? Or it doesn't have to be that extreme. Sometimes the answer is okay, fine. I'm going to do the absolute best with what I got. And that's how I'm going to judge my work. Okay. Again, I said this earlier in relation to my own consulting, but this is, I really believe this. And I coach people <laughs> and I tell them this, this same advice every single week. I swear to you. Judge the work on its own merit, not by what gets implemented, not by what gets built not by how many times they agree with you. Those are all bullshit metrics. They mean nothing. And they're completely out of your control. Judge the work on its own merit. Did you do everything you could to make this the best it can be? If the answer is yes, that's it. You know, did you warn people of potential missteps? Did you warn people that, hey, I don't think this is the right thing and here's why? I'm going to do what you want me to do. But here are the risks. If you did that, that's all you can do. Okay, so you should never look at yourself to be like, oh, well, this, I'm, 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 I'm achieving nothing. I'm accomplishing nothing. That's not true. It's not. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have another question, uh, Lorenzo. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Thank you very much for, for the presentation. Uh, actually, I have a question that is uh, yeah, slightly related to what we're talking about. Actually, I'm in the need of good UX designer for my team. And I find it really hard to find them, especially in, in Greece. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> if uh, I'm not looking into the right places or- What's your criteria? Uh, how, are you, how are you advertising that position? What do you want them to do? So uh, for the last year, I was trusting uh, HR and <laughs> the result was- was not very good. Even if they, the, don't, know, they don't know shit about this profession, <laughs> nothing. next to nothing. I mean, virtually nothing. Yeah. So yeah. Also, I also tried to to work on the on the higher uh, process. So now I'm like sending an exercise to uh, to the person I, I I want to interview before the interview, just to you know select people. But I I see you're not very convinced about that. No. <laughs> so yeah. Not, can I can ask them advice on it? And, and this is not about them, okay? Anyone who knows me knows that I don't believe in design exercises, okay? But this is more about, here, here's the part nobody gets. As an employer, as you, as the person doing the employing you, this is more, this is about you as well. That exercise is not going to get you what you want, I promise you, all right? It's not going to give you the certainty that you want. It's not going to tell you the kinds of things that you need to know either. But don't you think that the exercise can tell me like uh, implicit 
think about the person. So, for example, I give I I don't ask people. Uh, I I don't give a, a a time frame for doing the exercise, and it's really interesting for me to know if a person spent one hour or ten hours or twelve hours on the exercise. For example, to understand how you know how they how much time they think that specific exercise would need. No. No. <laughs> No, because number one, you're asking people to work for free. That's a huge investment, okay? Which means just by the nature of the thing, okay, that person, I promise you, no matter how this comes across, that person is going to feel like, Jesus, they want me to do all this work to get a job. You are never going to get that person's best because they're already in a state and a frame of mind, an emotional place where they're angry with you. Okay, they're feeling resentful already because you're asking them to do way too much work. What you want is you want to learn about that person in context of what they'd actually be doing. So the first part is a conversation. And what you ask them about is not about their skills or their process or any of that bullshit that shows up on typical interview questions or HR has or any of those things. What you ask them about are when a company has this kind of problem, you just set them up with a problem, all right? When, when we're trying to achieve this particular result, how would you go about doing that? That's it. That's the extent of the question. And you let them walk you through how they would do that. What you are looking for in that answer is you're looking for someone who doesn't assume that they know what the right thing to do is. You're looking for someone who is going to do, who says, well, first, I would need, I would want to learn more about the company and the product and the customers, and what's been done in the past, and what's worked, and what hasn't. You understand me? Those are the kinds of things that you want to hear up front in an initial conversation. The mistake that okay. most interviewers make is they go straight to process, and they go straight to artifacts, and they go straight to activities. It doesn't mean shit. You want someone who's going to think through, all right, how do I solve this problem, and who do I need to involve to solve this problem? Right? So the kinds of questions you ask matter a great deal. So you have an initial conversation around that. And then what you do is you bring that person in or you have them do some, some whiteboard, whiteboard work. All right. And personally, I believe that you pay them for a day. You say, look, can you spend half a day with my team and let's work on something together and let's see how it goes. Now, I've had companies say to me, well, that's an investment. Like we can't spend that money. And I ask them, how much money are you wasting with all these people who have to go through six rounds of interviews with this candidate, how much time and energy and money are you wasting with all the people that have to review the output of these, these design exercises? I promise you, it's more than what you would spend to pay that person a nominal rate for half a day. <laughs> and you'll learn a lot faster, okay, whether they're capable of doing the work or not. I say that as someone who yeah. has routinely helped companies hire people. I think the hiring process in this industry is broken. And I don't think it serves the employers either. It really doesn't. It's wasting your time as well. That's my two cents. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much. All right, get to reality. Make it easy on yourself. Get, get, to, get to reality, is what I would say. Thank you. Thank well, you, Lorenzo. For what it's worth, folks, I, I can hang out until two o'clock. Um, if you want to stay that long, that's entirely up to you. It's not my show, so. Two o'clock, so. Uh, that's, well, that's 20 minutes. 20, 20 minutes, 20. okay, 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 yeah. Let's use those 20 minutes. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Lorenzo, do you have another question or do you have uh, your hand? Let's, let's hear from somebody who hasn't. hasn't yeah, yeah I, I have, okay, I agree. Uh, I, Alex and Ben, okay, I'm not sure who's first. Alex, I see you uh, <laughs> first, so. Hello. Um, I, first of all, I wanted to thank you for your talk today. I found it really interesting. Um, and I just wanted to ask a follow-up question in terms of design tasks when interviewing. Because for me, as a person who's interviewed for a couple of jobs and I've been asked to carry out some design tasks, is a bit of a red flag, especially when I'm asked to work on my assumptions, not having that sort of valuable insight to hand. Is it worthwhile ever feeding that back to that company or do you just go and look for another job? Uh, both. <clears throat> In some cases, you have to do both. 
but but what I what I tell candidates all the time is that when you get a design challenge and you don't have enough information to execute on it, number one, let's just go down that path first. The first thing you come back with is is a bunch of questions. All right, you say, look, I'm happy to do this, but to do it effectively, here are the things I need to know. Right, and you you ask a set of questions. One of two things is going to happen. They're either going to come back and, and give you answers and say, okay, well, this, 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 and this. Or they're going to say, well, we can't, we're not going to tell you that. You just have to do the challenge. That is a red flag, okay? Because it's a bullshit premise. There's no way for them to accurately judge whether you're fit for the job if you're operating without context, All right? That means one of two things. It means either that they don't know what they're hiring for, really, or it means that they're looking for something specific in your work and they're unwilling to tell you what it is. Either way, that is not a, a trusting <laughs> situation, all right? So you do kick it back and say, look, I'm happy to do this, but here's what I need to know, right? And then if the answer is no, then if you can afford to, not everybody can afford to do this when you're looking for a job, okay? If you can afford to, you say, well, I'm gonna have to decline. And you do. Right, because it won't serve you. I know people, when you go down that route, most people I know have gone down that route and they've gone through literally four to six rounds of interviews and they didn't get the job. And the reason they didn't get the job is because there is massive context missing in the hiring process. Right, not only will they not get the job, 20 other people who apply won't get the job either because the team doesn't know what it's looking for. People hiring don't know what they're looking for. They haven't properly defined that yet. And that's rampant in this industry right now. So there's nothing wrong with saying, okay, I can do that. Can you clarify these things for me? I don't think that's an unreasonable ask. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, question from Ben. Ben? Uh, hello, Joe. Uh, thanks for the talk. And I have some of your courses on Udemy already, so they are quite good. So everybody could just should check them out. Uh, <laughs> question is uh like now i just feel less and less motivated with the company i'm working with so i've decided to move on uh improving my portfolio and started to look for a job like a early next year so do you have any advice like how i should spend the time like the seven work seven working hours like before i send the quit email because I just feel like I should make full use of this time to yes, you should. all the knowledge for my next job. Again, I mean, look for look for opportunities uh, where you can you can do things that matter. Start um, making sure that you can tell stories in your resume in your portfolio that matter. Okay, all the things that I just talked about today. Yeah. Even though they're relevant to be an employee, they are absolutely 100,000% relevant to a portfolio and a resume as well. Okay, I say this all the time to people. Every single bullet point on a resume, for example, a CV, every single point should not just be a laundry list of I did this, did this, responsible for this, like blah, 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 whatever. It should be a statement of intent. A resume and a portfolio, these are sales pitches. So every single bullet underneath whatever job you held should be accomplished this, <laughs> made this better, improved this by doing whatever it is that you did. All right. The very beginning of that sentence is always, here's what I made better, faster, cheaper, more efficient, more profitable, whatever it is. That's what you're looking for. All right. And that is how you use your remaining time. If you feel like you don't have enough compelling stories like that to tell, you need to start looking for them before you quit. It's, okay. it's hard to get the result like KPI and to the metrics to put on my resume. If you, if you have them, great. If you don't, who cares? Did anything change or not? Did anything get better or not? Okay. Generally, I don't care about the numbers. If you have them, that's awesome. A lot of people don't have, but they do know that something changed. Sometimes that's internal, right? I spearheaded an internal process to change the way that we worked. And we cut down the amount of team rework by 30%. I mean, that's a thing as well. 
that's not a product facing thing, but it is sure as hell an employee thing, right? That makes you valuable as a person. So even changes that you've accomplished internally by doing things different, those stories are worth telling. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Valentina with a question. Hello, Joe. Um, a oh, quick thanks. question. <laughs> I'm here. A quick question for me is about educating oneself on business. So what is the best way to talk common language with stakeholders? Thank you. I'll learn about business. Okay. Um, <laughs> I would love to say that I have this in place already. I don't. But but one of the things I'm really trying to do is I want to establish a mini sort of uh, designer UX MBA um, for people in this profession. All right. I want them to have the basic business education that all business majors have. <laughs> that said, it is worth your while to take any and all sort of business focused courses that you can get your hands on. You know, Udemy, I'm sure is, is full of them. All right. Learn about strategic business decisions. Um, things like, like I showed you, like look up the business canvas and look up everything around it that sort of brought it into being, you know, anything that Michael Porter has written about strategy, for example, is well worth your while, you know, um, all those kinds of things, but anything you learn about business, anything coursework and stuff that is, that is aimed at business folks, as opposed to UX folks go there. You're going to feel like you're out of your league. <laughs> it's all going to feel foreign to some degree, but it's really, really important. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Valentina. Anastasia with a question. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, nice seeing you all. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very inspiring. And thank you, Ioannis and Dimitris, for uh, your hosting. Uh, my question is, when you first talk, let's say, with a client that comes to you, uh, for, for, for my services, let's say, uh, in my point of view, in my mind, I have it that there are times that uh, I understand that it is my job to ask questions until I discover what they need and what they want. And yep. if I make the wrong questions, I will change until I find, uh, until I fight it. Right. Uh, what happens when uh, sometimes I feel that I spend way too much time and uh, there was not a concrete outcome of how uh, I could actually help them. And what's bothering me is that uh, I feel that they, they either actually don't know what they want, or maybe I was failing at finding what they want. How can I separate those cases? It's hard. Um, I would say if, you, if you're asking them concrete questions, okay, about, about what brought them to you in the first place, and you're still not getting answers. For example, the one question I lead with all the time, no matter what they come to me with, okay? They say, we need to redesign this, whatever. I, I ignore whatever they say they need to do. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I just kind of ignore that. I pretend that that statement didn't even exist. I understand. What I ask is, what led you to the point where you said, we need to redesign this? What led you to the point where you said, we would need to start talking to people about getting help with whatever? What event occurred? What changed? <laughs> What, what got worse, right? What happened? What's there is almost the always an event of some sort that is driving the fact that they're talking to you. Something happened. Something took place or something has been taking place over a certain period of time, right? That's the question that you ask. Now, if they can't answer that, then the truth is they don't know why they're here. They probably just have some vague notion that they need UX help or they need design help or they need something, but they don't really know what that is. Mm -hmm. um, so and all this you is can do is try the, to find the trigger, out. Right? The trigger. What's that? Okay. The trigger. What was the trigger? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Because yeah. that dictates how you can help them. Why Why they came here. Okay. Yeah. okay. Why are Thank you, you here? Thank you. Why are you talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you here? Yes. That's really what it is. Okay. Yes. And, and I always lead with that. Always, always, That's always. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that allows me to say, 
Okay, well, in that case, it sounds like I understand what you're asking for, but I, I think the issue in my experience is usually deeper than that. It's probably something else. And we probably need to figure out what that is before we decide what to redesign and what not to redesign or what to do, right? Okay, so that changes the nature of the conversation and it changes the proposal. Now, for me, this is simple because I only do one thing. I only sell one thing and that's my time. <laughs> I, and I sell my brain, my expertise. So the engagement is the engagement is the engagement. You're going to get me for X amount of days. And whatever you do at that time is entirely up to you. That's my pitch, right? So my proposals don't change a lot. But I can, at least in that conversation, make suggestions and say, well, well you might want to think about this, 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 and this. I always approach those meetings as a working meeting. And I do this, and this goes for in-house people as well. If you're having a conversation with a stakeholder, okay, or potential clients, the same gig, you got to find out what it is that, that brought us collectively to this place so that you can suggest something that has merit. So you can say something out loud that makes them think, oh, I didn't think of that. That might be worth doing. Every meeting to me is a working meeting, even with a prospective client. I'm trying to give them a, a sample of what it's like to work with me. So I'm giving them advice on the spot. It's not the whole enchilada or it's not everything, but it's a piece. It's a piece. So they understand. Now, if they still insist that they know the way forward, I'm out. Okay. I'm out. And I learned that lesson the hard way. It took me far too long to start doing that. Okay. In my career, but you got to learn to say no to people who don't know what the hell they want. More importantly, you got to say no to people who don't know why they want those things, you know, or, or why they're talking to you in the first place. Those are the, the people who will waste your time. They will not pay you enough. They will ask for far too much. And it just won't be worth it in any number of ways. They'll prevent you from finding better clients, quite frankly. Thank you, Anastasia. And we have... Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank You're you welcome. Much. We have one last question, Costadinos. Hi, 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 Joe. Thank you so much for for this presentation. It was really insightful. So I want to ask something about uh, we talked about earlier about uh, laying offs, and uh, we realize that more and more companies are outsourcing their workforce. So I would like to ask, as a designer, is it a better? I work for a consulting agency uh, dedicated to a client. Is it better for me to stay? At the, uh, at the agency and try and work my way up or uh, joining an in-house team and, you know, work from there. I mean, it feels like I'm not connected enough with the product and with the team at the client. Mm -hmm. And it feels like uh, sometimes this for me is a step down in my evolution. Well, you got to define what that means, okay? What do you want your career trajectory to look like? If it's a step down, in, in what way? Clearly define what that is and what that means. How does it prevent you from doing things you want to do later, right? If you have clear answers to that, then that can help point you in the right, in the right direction. But you know what I mean? You got to be really specific about what you want. You got to be really specific about what you want your career to look like. Is one better than the other? Not necessarily. The path is different for everyone. I, I do not believe firmly, okay? I do not believe that there is one path to success in this profession. And I don't believe that one path is better than another. What I know for a fact at 55 years of age is that there are no wrong turns, okay? There are none. The only mistake you can make in your career is not being honest with yourself about what you want, okay? It's not being honest with yourself about how you wanna work, how you wanna engage with people, how you wanna be treated, all sorts of things, right? That's, those are mistakes. Everything else is a course correction. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. So the only way you're gonna know whether you're progressing or not is, is having a really clear picture of what you want and what it's gonna to take to get there. The path is different for everyone. Sometimes you won't know, 
All right. This is my point in the whole wrong turn analogy. Sometimes you won't know. All right. You won't have a sense of whether you're moving forward or backwards. The only thing you can do in some cases is keep playing it forward until it comes clear. Because sometimes yeah. it won't for a while. The road will just be foggy and eventually it'll part and you go, okay. Something will present itself, an opportunity, a decision, a, a something. You know, and you'll go down that path and you'll, you'll discover something. It's always going to be messy. It's never as clear cut as everybody wants to make it be, you know. We want these perfect recipes for how we're supposed to live our lives or do our work or, or have successful careers. It doesn't exist. It's messy. It's, it's a million course corrections. One thing I heard years ago, and this is cliche, but I'm going to say it anyway, because um, I literally didn't know this. And this was a long time ago, admittedly, but I always had the sense that when, you know, when they launch rockets into space or whatever, I mean, there's, this is all programmed. Everything's on a very specific set course. It's all planned out, right? The thing goes where it's supposed to go. What I did not realize is the degree to which when a rocket gets launched to you know to the moon or whatever, it deviates from course like thousands of times. <laughs> not just, not a handful of times, like a thousand times, all right? It just continuously goes, oh, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> and they have to bring it back, you know? Like, no, 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 it's here. And they veers again and they're like, oh shit, bring it back. That's kind of like, that to me was one of the greatest metaphors for life, for career, for all this stuff that we're trying to navigate, okay? It's not about, again, it's not about knowing the perfect path and executing on the path and like, yes, I'm achieving my goals. I don't think anything is that clear cut. I think you, you wander, you deviate, and you figure out where the path is based on that deviation. <laughs> was this the right thing or the wrong thing? Oh shit, it was the wrong thing. All right, we'll come back here and we'll try something else. I mean... That is still true in my own life. All right, it's the way all this works. Trying to have certainty, I think is, it's a bit of a fool's errand. I don't think it exists. Do your best, be honest with yourself about what you're experiencing, be honest with yourself about what you want. It's the best advice I can give you. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, balance is not just finding the right spot but continue always try to find the right spot by getting to another direction or another right. direction so balance is always try to find balance not just find the point and stick to it that's right i mean you you know you, you see the the buddha behind me there <laughs> all right what i love about this philosophy and what i've always loved about it at its core despite how many how people misinterpret it there's no such thing as a perfect state all right what they describe as enlightenment is, is nothing more than being aware Okay, it's being present. It's being honest about the reality of things. It's 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 understanding that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Are you going to make missteps? Yes, of course. But the only time you suffer is when you beat the shit out of yourself for that instead of learning from it and saying, okay, I probably shouldn't do that anymore. I should probably go do this. It's practice. They think of what they do as practice, which means it's never done. You are constantly, constantly, constantly reapplying what you just learned. <laughs> that's all. And I think that's important because you, it allows you to let yourself off the hook a little bit and not be so hard on yourself. Exactly. Joy, thanks. Thanks again. We're so grateful to have you here uh, today in the UX Chris community. Thanks a lot for your time. And thanks to, to everyone who joined and became part of this discussion uh about such hot topics two hours straight uh we have our new record and Amen. we still have a lot to discuss we don't have to teach you <laughs> but okay uh <laughs> we have to you know uh we have to um to be fair with uh, with our uh, timetables uh so let's yeah, unfortunately i have to go i gotta be go be responsible now <laughs> uh let's jump over to uh linkedin and let's just wait, you know, wait, well, Joe, where, where people can find you? Where would you prefer to contact you? Oh, um, and also, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn all the time. I'm on uh, X all the time, even though it's dying. Um, those are the two big spots. You can go to givegoodux.com and check that out. My courses, the UX 365 Academy 
is at learn.givegoodux.com. Um, you know, it's to me, it's an alternative to boot camps. It's an alternative to all this perfect world stuff that doesn't really help anybody do anything. Um, but those are the places you can find me. And although I don't always get to people's questions as quickly as I would like, uh, I am one of those people who answers everything I am asked. Okay. Cause I think that's the right thing to do. Lots of people did it for me early in my career. The, the very least I can do is try to pay that forward. So please don't feel reticent about reaching out and saying, Hey, and if I can help you, I will. If I can't, if it's too involved, I'll tell you that too. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so let's jump over to LinkedIn. Keep this conversation um, buzzing while you are at it. Don't forget, you can ask your questions and also have the opportunity to bug some great reads. All thanks to our sponsor. So remember to tag your post with UX and UX Greece and get them up in the next three or four hours. Uh, speaking of our sponsors, let's give uh, them a thanks. Zansin Labs from Scratch Studio, the UX Prodigy. A big thanks being with us for another uh, season. Um, everyone look for them and check their work and uh, also follow the UX Greece page on LinkedIn to get notifications from the upcoming events and on the recording we have to use this recording as a UX therapy every day in the morning every day in the night uh, I think we, you all know what I mean uh, and also check the um, the UX Saloniki and uh, Athens UX communities on meetup.com we had a meetup in the Athens community yesterday we have an in-person meetup in Saloniki and it is going to be announced tomorrow. It, it is going to be an in-person gathering. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, and uh, that's all for today. Joe, once again, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks a lot for your engagement, for your for the discussion. Uh, see you again uh, in about three months or see you in person in one of our next local uh, meetups. Take care. Have a great uh, night or day. Thanks all. Appreciate it. Thank bye bye. You. Bye bye. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.